Alrighty, let's get started. My name is Sarah Terry Cobo. I'm a senior reporter and digital strategist with the Journal Record newspaper. I cover healthcare, among other things, um, and have written a little bit about uh, cannabidiol and CBD. So this afternoon we are hosting Journal Record Roundtable for State Question 788, which would uh, legalize medical marijuana. And there are a lot of interesting discussions around this, uh, around this battle, ballot measure. So uh, first of all, we would like to thank our generous sponsors. Uh, we have CBD Plus USA and New Health Solutions Oklahoma Incorporated. Um, so thank you very much for sponsoring this event. And then also we would like to welcome our panelists. I'll introduce each of them by name and then they can give, the, uh, give a short sentence about who they are and, and uh, why they're here. So uh, with us we have uh, Blake Johnson with uh, Crow and Dunleavy. We have August Rivera with Oklahomans Against State Question 788. We have Bud Scott with New Health Solutions Oklahoma. And we have Jake Chilcote with CBD Plus USA. So uh, Blake if you'd like to say a word then we can just go down the panel and begin from here. Yeah hey Blake Johnson. Um, I uh, am an attorney at Crow and Dunleavy uh, in Oklahoma City. We are a um, broad and offer a broad and wide variety of legal services to uh, participants in a equally broad variety of industries and over the last uh, six months to a year or so I've been doing a lot of exploratory work for the firm on uh, state question 788 medical marijuana programs around the country uh, and advising our clients in uh, just about every industry about how uh, this reform would affect them if enacted. Uh, August Rivera, co-chair, Oklahomans Against 788. Uh, we, d we formed specifically to raise questions about how this will affect Oklahoma and Oklahoma communities uh, throughout the state. Uh, there are a lot of concerns and a lot of questions that this particular state question raises that we really don't know what will happen should this pass. And so we're here basically raising concern or raising our voices to voice our concerns. Uh, my name is Bud Scott. I serve as the executive director of New Health Solutions Oklahoma, which is the 501c6 trade association representing the emerging medical cannabis industry in Oklahoma. Uh, as an attorney, I've practiced for numerous years representing cannabis clients in Colorado, Oregon, Washington, and here in Oklahoma, primarily in Colorado, however. I um, also want to point out that Crow and Dunleavy is one of the sponsors of this event. Um, so happy to be here. Uh, we're excited to work with members of our policymaking institutions to develop sound and effective regulations uh, once 788 is passed to implement this in an expedient manner. I'm Jake Chilcote uh, with CBD Plus USA. We're representing the uh, retail front of the cannabis industry um, and you know basically our end goal is to help people and so um, we just want to make sure that whatever happens with medical marijuana um, or any other version of cannabis. We just want to make sure that it's in the best interest of the community and in the people that we serve. Fantastic. Thanks, gentlemen. Uh, now our goal here is to provide a, a balanced objective discussion about what is going to be on the ballot here. And um, so we're going to hopefully leave some time for uh, follow-up questions as we go along. And um, so let's start off and we can just go down the panel from here and begin with Blake and, and proceed that way. Um, so state question 788 does not restrict a physician's recommendation of mar medical marijuana to a particular qualifying condition. So maybe explain the difference between this and recreational marijuana and, and why that distinction is important. Yeah, well, uh, as a lawyer, this is a pretty easy question. Um, the hallmark of a recreational marijuana system is that any adult can walk into a licensed dispensary and purchase marijuana products, no questions asked. The hallmark of a medical marijuana system is that a, an adult can only do so if he or she has received the approval of a board certified physician and been licensed by the state to treat a medical ailment with medical marijuana therapies. State question 788 unequivocally requires the approval of a doctor and, the license, and a licensure by the state before an individual can obtain or consume medical marijuana products. The, uh, Qualifying conditions question, of course, liberalizes access to medical marijuana treatments. Uh, I think if, uh, if the concern is that it does, does so too broadly, then the, uh, the 
retort to that would be, of course, that a physician is required both by 788 and by the standards of professional conduct that govern his or her industry to apply the same standards of reasonable and prudent care that he or she would make and uh, would rely on in making any other recommendation or approval for medical treatment uh, in the uh, medical marijuana context. So for that reason, I think 788 is unequivocally a medical marijuana bill. Uh, and that the industry that it proposes to establish is unequivocally a medical marijuana industry. Thank you. August, would you like to add to that? Uh, no, I think he summed it up pretty quickly. I mean, you know, fully. But uh, the one thing that we question is the actual what qualifies an unqualifying condition. Uh, we don't know that. Um, we don't know what doctors are going to do. Uh, we don't know. I mean, essentially, I could walk into a doctor right now and say I have pain. Is the doctor going to really know that I'm in pain even though I'm not? You know, that's how we got started with the opioid addictions. And I guess to that point, that same concern would apply to any other medical treatments. Absolutely. Right? A, a doctor yeah. is certainly re expected to observe reasonable standards of care, uh, but is capable of stepping outside of those, both in terms of medical marijuana or opioids or any other um, medical treatment or, or uh, therapy. And I think to presuppose this question with the concept that our physician community uh, is inherently irresponsible, that they're going to abuse the system, uh, I think is a condemnation of our medical community. Um, the amount of physicians that have uh, illegally permitted or uh, prescribed opioids or other medicines uh, that have led to our addiction and our opioid epidemic in this state and this country are really a pretty small fraction of the overall medical community. So uh, to start this discussion with a, an inherent, uh, like I said, condemnation of the medical community, I think is pr pretty flawed analysis. Was it a condemnation? Jake, would you like to add that? I think that with most industries, you find good people in it, bad people in it, whatever. Um, but I think that the the deal, it's interesting that you brought up the opioid epidemic because there, there, there seems to be a lot more ability for the patient to abuse that as well as maybe maybe a physician. I know that those numbers are smaller, but the patient numbers are, are a lot bigger. And obviously, this is something different than opioids in general. Um, but when we lump them all together, then that's that's what we see is, is now we have a product that, that both parties can can you know, either overprescribe or overuse. Okay. Uh, it's a really good point. Um, August, you, you mentioned that and that these medical, mar medical marijuana recommendations could be made by a board certified physician, which would allow any kind of doctor, which could include a veterinarian, right, or a podiatrist to make the recommendation. So um, help me understand, it, are, are these parts of your concerns that you have? And, and if uh, there should be restrictions on the type of physician, what are those? And, and if, if you'd like to oppose that, then please well, let me know. Well, I mean, look, the way that we have normally approved drugs is through an FDA system. It's, you know, it gets tested, it gets researched, and it's tested for efficacy and safety, and then it's released out to the public. What this does is circumvent that entire process by just giving unfettered access to people who say they have a certain condition that uh, is in need of, 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 of marijuana, mm -hmm. to be quite honest with you. Now, I am not against helping people achieve some kind of comfort uh, for their suffering. However, I do have a problem giving access to just about anybody, especially if they're over 18, especially just the wording in this language that allows for a lot of this, uh, a lot of the marijuana to be, you know, possibly abused. N just not even by adults, but also by children as well. Uh, well, if I if I might uh, just push back on one point, I, I I think it would it stretches reason and credulity to suppose that a veterinarian would be permitted to prescribe or to approve a medical marijuana treatment for an, uh, for a human following 788 or otherwise. Any physician is governed by rules established by the governing body of his or her profession. Those rules require that a physician make prescriptions or approve treatments only within their course of treatment. Uh, in particular, veterinarians' rules of professional conduct, which are codified into law in the Oklahoma Administrative Code, prohibit a veterinarian from writing a prescription except as necessary to promote the health of an animal. Uh, it's, I, I think, um, simply not credible 
to propose that veterinarians would be approving medical marijuana treatments for humans after 788. For dogs or, or cats, I suppose that's, that's possible. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> Blake, Blake handled it uh, pretty completely there. I, it, once again, this is uh, the premise that veterinarians or any other medical professional uh, that are not a board certified physician uh, will be just freely throwing out cannabis products to anyone who walks in the door is once again, it's a condemnation of your medical community. Uh, how many physicians actually do this with other pre-existing um, pharmaceuticals? There's some, but the vast majority do not. And to act like this is something that most physicians are going to do um, is really just counterintuitive. Um, you know, we're really committed to working with our medical community here in Oklahoma, to educating them on how cannabis operates, how different delivery systems have impacted and been demonstrated to impact medical conditions. Just do a simple Google search. There's hundreds and hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific studies that have been published everywhere from the Journal of American Medicine to the Journal of American Stroke Medicine uh, to the Journal of American Cancer Medicine. These are well-established studies that demonstrate the efficacy of cannabis and cannabis-related products at addressing these medical conditions. So we have a system here. Um, there, there's claims that this is usually goes through the FDA process. That's true. That's true. A lot of medicine usually does go through the FDA process. Uh, however, that process is extremely strenuous. And because of the federal government's continuing treatment of cannabis as a Schedule I narcotic, the ability to conduct studies and submit through FDA analysis outside of synthetic THC and outside of synthetic cannabis products has been incredibly restrictive. So as a result, there's constantly uh, points, we've seen this coming from the State Medical Association, that there's no, there's no scientific support for claims that me medical cannabis actually helps. Like I said, just do some basic searches, and you'll find there are hundreds of studies that demonstrate this. Uh, the Wall Street, or the Washington Post, excuse me, two weeks ago, they conducted a survey with all these cancer physicians across the country, and over half of those that were surveyed indicated they, that they have already recommended medical cannabis for their patients. This demonstrates that many of our medical community, many doctors, many support staff, recognize the well-established benefits and we're fully in favor of conducting additional uh, voracious research here in Oklahoma. It's our goal here with New Health Solutions to actually work with our medical research institutions, our physicians on conducting extensive research on the benefits of cannabis products and utilizing this research corridor we have over here on Lincoln to become an industry leader. There's no reason we shouldn't be doing this. It's an incredible opportunity. Anything to add to that, Jake? The, the biggest thing that I think, you know, a lot of people get caught up on is um, either the distinction that we that we kind of talked about with the opioids versus versus cannabis. And this industry has kind of circumnavigated the um, the FDA rules and regulations. But is it is it the same type of product that the FDA is used to to regulating is where are the studies that show that it's that that it's harmful as synthetic, which they're promoting and pushing. And so, you know, if you if you break those out into two different two different programs, I think that the that the um, data is there whether they want to they want to see it or not. Um, and you know, we want to work with we want to work with all of the entities and industries that that benefit um, people in general. And so, this is one of those things that the people have kind of have kind of come up and and, and spoken. And um, you know, it's there's not really a precedent for an industry going around um, a big entity like the FDA so far. But you know, at the same time. This is something that's that's natural, and that it's a lot of people are, are making some serious claims that for what it's doing for them and, and for their their customers or patients or whoever's prescribing it, and um, you know I think that this is an, an inevitability. At at some point we're gonna we're gonna be um, issuing this to to customers and patients. 
Um, now, we really just want to be sure that, that Oklahoma is doing this the right way because there, there's definitely a right and a wrong way. And I think we can all agree that there's a right and a wrong way to do this um, as, as far as the logistics of actually getting it to the customers or patients in what capacity are they able to get that. Um, and then the, the logistics across the board as far as being able to track and source and make sure that everything is clean above reproach. And I think that, that is the, that's the biggest area of concern. Um, I think that the people have spoken, like I said earlier, that this is something that we do need and want. It's a, ne it's a necessity at this point, and the industry has grown and I think has shown and proven that. Um, but it's it's going to be one of those things that it, if, if it's done right, it can change the world. If it's done wrong, then it's still going to change the world, but it's just going to take a little bit longer and, and people might get burned in the process. And and that's what we're concerned about is having those, those people burned because who's going to be there to actually pick up the pieces for them? Look, I am all for lobbying the federal government and having cannabis lowered schedule to actually have research done. I am all for that. I think people are worth it. I really do. But we need to do this the right way. I'm going to echo what he says. We have to do this the right way. Because personally, I mean, I've been in child welfare for 11 years. I've been in substance abuse prevention. And to be quite honest with you, I've seen the damage that substance abuse can do to families and individuals. I just don't want to see this applied here again. We're already dealing with all substances already that we deal with issues, tobacco, alcohol, and opioids. Now we're being asked to add a fourth one to that list. Well, That's all I'm doing is raising our concerns. To be, to be clear, folks who want access to marijuana in Oklahoma probably already have it. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that there is a lot of empirical support for the notion that liberalizing marijuana laws increases the number of folks who rely or depend on marijuana. Jake had a good point about the right and the wrong way, and, and Blake, you had a good point about um, physicians acting within their own governing board. So maybe let's talk about that for a moment. So if the state question does pass, do you anticipate or would you recommend additional uh, regulations um, to govern the medical marijuana industry within the state? Um, so are there more regulations that are necessary to protect people or to ensure the industry is developed safely and above board? Hey, you're talking about a very vast and expansive industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry in several states. Uh, the, the average state where you see a, an, an actually effective medical cannabis regime, uh, Colorado, California, Washington, Oregon, Michigan, uh, the ones where you've seen a successful program, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of supplemental regulations addressing everything from packaging and labeling standards to quality care and testing. Uh, so absolutely we will have to implement supplemental rules uh, either through legislative action uh, or through regulatory uh, rule promulgation. Uh, it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, state question 788, like most state questions, is not comprehensive. It doesn't address every single facet of an issue. Generally in the policymaking process, when you ask voters to vote on a state question, it creates enabling legislation that then allows for the legislature or an agency to then further develop rules surrounding that specific subject. Uh, to act like 788 is somehow supposed to be the end-all be-all of cannabis policy is uh, rather disingenuous. Can I ask a question, um, and this is from my understanding, um, whenever we add these supplemental um, rules and regulations to this, is that something that can be done to the to the budgeting of the tax dollars that are um, generated through this? Could, can you can you prom, uh, put in place those rules and policies so that you can allocate after the fact? Absolutely. I mean, this is a statutory state question, so it can be amended and modified uh, at the will of the people, at the will of the state legislature, uh, and through the the agencies that will be designated to address this. Do you think in its current form? Um, the, the, the funds going to the general fund. Um, what are your thoughts on, on the placement there? Well, you have a 7% retail sax, uh, tax, excuse me, not saxophone, but a tax. <laughs> um, that's, <laughs> that's been applied through state question 788. Um, the, the numbers right now, I think the State Department of Health, which is the identified agency within 788 to administer and regulate this program, um, they're, at, they're indicating about a two to $3 million annual budget need to cover the cost of administering this program. Um, I think if you looked at some of the more conservative estimates on what these uh, retail tax 
revenue would be to what more than cover this. Um, however, uh, even with all of the controversies surrounding the Department of Health at this moment, um, they have adequate funding available to actually administer this program. Uh, it's definitely there. You can talk to the state. The state's budget director is OMES about this, and there's funding to cover the initial program now. Uh, there's other provisions about this that say that any additional funds would go towards common education, mm -hmm. that would go towards uh, substance abuse, so drug and alcohol uh, prevention programs, uh, which we're all in favor of. Uh, however, we do believe that uh, the licensure fees, and it, there's no inspection fees established in 788, the, the vast majority of states that you look at with these programs in place, your, your fees are going to be around ten to $15,000 per application, uh, which helps to sustain those programs internally. Uh, there's often occupational license fees for everyone from the janitors to the people harvesting product to the people planting, doing processing. Uh, there's individual professional licenses that help supplement those funds and cover the cost of administering the program. We're, we're really not talking about anything much different than, say, the, the ABLE Commission here in Oklahoma, which is a self-financing institution as well. There was legislation that uh, did not pass in this most current session, of course, uh, including uh, Senator Yen's SB 1120 that would have uh, changed the ballot language, or, or not changed the ballot language, but um, kind of made some modifications um, so that it would have fewer of some of these potential problems if it does pass. Um, but I, I am interested in what are some of the potential, um, you know, additional regulations that could be helpful, you know, in, in terms of um, medical agencies or other physicians if it passes. There are some provisions from 1120 that were actually uh, positive recommendations, in particular how to address physicians that abuse the process, um, how to go through the medical licensure board and address that issue, how to require continuing education um, and professional training for the medical community as it relates to writing recommendations for this product. Uh, unfortunately, 1120 was also, in our opinion, uh, way too restrictive. Um, it completely limited the amount of conditions that could be prescribed for it. These are very different terms of art that we're discussing between a recommendation and a prescription. Senate Bill 1120 called for a prescription, which would, would have required a physician to quite literally say, patient A, I recommend that you have 15 grams of Maui Waui uh, that you're going to use in a smokable format, and that is your specific prescription, kind of like they would say, here's a package of Zithromax, your z -Pack. Uh, I want you to take this for a week and then come back and we'll get you another prescription. That's how a prescription process works. Uh, now, in the cannabis industry, in the 30 mm -hmm. states that have medical marijuana in the United States and the District of Columbia, uh, there's very few states that have any of such of those provisions. It's typically because of the absence of very specific or specific industry standards on which products are very impactful for specific medical conditions that the physicians usually make a recommendation to a patient to go and try this product, see what works best for them, because it's a very uh, subjective standard, um, and it's going to be different for every patient, just like with any other kind of medicine. So we have to see what works best for them. California was one of the first states that um, that passed medical marijuana way back in 1994. It did have restrictions on medical conditions. Um, August, are there specific medical conditions that you can think of that uh, would be appropriate for this, or maybe not appropriate for this, as we're talking about what regulations maybe could um, help strengthen this if it does pass? Well, I'm not a doctor, so I, I couldn't really answer that Fair. question, and I don't really think anybody on this panel is a doctor. Sure, uh, doctor. <laughs> but um, obviously, just from the research that I've read, um, uh, seizures, for one thing, uh, would probably be a, a, a good condition that it, it has a potential to actually um, uh, treat. Uh, in the summer, I think the FDA, there is a possibility of, of it approving Epidiolex, which is a pure form of CBD. And so that is one particular uh, cannabis-based, uh, another cannabis-based or marijuana-based uh, uh, medicine that the FDA ha will have approved, hopefully. Now, it only treats 40% of the uh, individuals who have actually uh, been treated for it uh, for severe cases of epilepsy. Um, outside of those, now, 
on the panel here, we can go back and forth on who, what conditions can it be treated, what conditions should be treated, and what shouldn't be treated. You know, there are conditions, uh, specifically uh, mental illness conditions like anxiety and depression that po people probably shouldn't be doing or using marijuana. I mean, there are other uh, uh, anecdotal evidence where CBD is actually uh, does treat some kind of chronic pain, but. Outside of that, I, I couldn't really answer it. I mean, this is just research and stuff that I've read on, online and in books. Well, I would say to that point, when we talk about mental health issues, addiction, which many people in the medical community believe to be a mental health issue uh, and a medical condition, uh, let's cite to one study issued by the University of Mississippi, the National Institute of Health, and the National Institute of Mental Health from August of 2017. University of Mississippi was, at the time, the only uh, state research-based institution that received federal dollars that was authorized to grow cannabis product and then use it in their testing and analysis. So what they issued in their report demonstrated that pharmaceutical grade dosages of both CBD, including with CBG and THC, was effective in regenerating the receptors in your brain that call for opioids and methamphetamine. To be clear, uh, CBD, of course, stands for cannabidiol or cannabidiol, perhaps I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, and CBG is, remind me, bud. They're all different components of the cannabis plant. There's 29 different components of the cannabis plant, so, and several of those have been found to have varying impacts. Um, we're still just understanding our product. If I could just circle Please. back quickly, uh, I think August is right to point out that nobody on this panel is a medical doctor. Absolutely. I think that might be an argument in favor of 788 as written uh, because it does not suppose that either lawyers or legislators are in a position to tell doctors what conditions are properly treated by these therapies, but instead requires that doctors rely again on the same standards of prudent and reasonable care that they would apply to any other medical decision. Absolutely. With regard to uh, additional regulations, I think Bud's right that those are inevitable. Uh, I think that would be the case with uh, nearly any state question. Uh, two areas that I think are very likely to receive attention from either legislators or regulators uh, will be testing. I think it's highly likely, and this addresses some of the concerns that Jake raised, I think it's highly likely that there will be implemented a testing regimen that requires that products are uh, tested uh, and that their uh, THC content, their CBD content, et cetera, is established and made clear to the, uh, the customer or the patient in this case. Uh, and, and along similar lines, and to address some of August's concerns about um, these drugs finding their ways into the hands of children or, or, uh, or folks who are not licensed to use them, I think it's likely that we'll see additional regulation addressing labeling requirements as well, uh, so as to ensure that labels are designed to effectively and competently inform consumers and to avoid the risk, for example, of children mistaking a medical substance for candy or, or, or a toy. Absolutely. Speaking of testing, um, Blake, you represent employers, right? And, and you had a discussion recently about how this could affect um, employee drug testing. So is that something that you can address, you know, because SQ 788 says that an employer cannot fire an employee solely for a positive test of THC. So how, how does this affect drug-free workplace policies or applicable laws? Well, to be clear, 788 says that an employer cannot fire a licensed medical marijuana user on the sole basis of a positive test for THC. So from the beginning, we're talking about a relatively small group or a uh, class of employees within the state, those that are licensed by the state to treat legitimate medical ailments with medical marijuana therapies. Naturally, most Oklahomans will not be licensed by the state to obtain those therapies, and so naturally most employees will be unaffected by 788's ostensible employment protections. It's also true that any employer who receives either a license or a monetary benefit from the federal government, think for example the transportation industry which is regulated by the Department of Transportation, they would be accepted altogether from the employment employment protections that 788 establishes. So from the outset, we're talking about a relatively small slice of Oklahoma's employees who would receive any protection whatsoever from 788. Now as to the protection that they would receive, they could not be discriminated against, that's to say their employer could not take adverse employment action against them simply because either 
they hold a license to use medical marijuana or simply because they fail a, t a test for THC. The reason, of course, being that a positive test for THC is not an indication that one was impaired at any particular time. Employers would remain perfectly within their rights, and let me add that in the state of Oklahoma, an employer's right to take adverse employment action is very, very broad, and employers would remain very much within their rights to take adverse employment action against an employee who possessed marijuana on the job, who used marijuana on the job, or who was impaired on the job. The sole basis for making the determination that an employee was impaired while on the job cannot be a positive test for THC. That does not preclude an employer from testing folks. Say, for example, an accident occurs on the job site. Employers would be within their rights to test the folks who were involved in that accident. They simply could not rely solely on the positive test for THC in order to be, uh, make an adverse employment decision. So employers, and let me add that employers are already, responsible employers are already very, very familiar with these responsibilities and obligations. They encounter it every day in the workplace uh, with employees who might uh, be suspected of drinking on the job or of abusing prescription drugs on the job. And under those circumstances, employers typically document observations of the indicia of impairment and pair those documented observations with something like a positive test for, uh, for THC to make out a case for termination. I don't think that 788 is likely to dramatically upset these sort of routine employment practices that, again, most of the state's responsible employers are already very familiar with. And Blake, when you're talking about testing, you're talking about a gas or liquid chromatography test, not necessarily a drug screening. Um, is there any verbiage in State Question 788 um, that talks about the distinction on, on um, obviously, a, a screen, a, a yes or no test, a, a more simplistic test than, than maybe more, one of the more complex tests, the chromatography test? Um, is there any verbiage that, that says that, that those tests are what are to be used in order to make a, an employment decision or anything like that? No, 788 doesn't include any language to that effect. Uh, and I, I, I imagine, though, and it sounds like you're a little bit more familiar with testing protocols <laughs> than I am, uh, but I imagine that, again, um, the uh, the most the, the state's average employer has encountered these issues in other contexts and will likely apply the same kind of protocol and policies that they do under those other, uh, in those other circumstances to uh, a, a, an employee who's licensed to use medical marijuana. Well, and the reason I bring it up, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, just to interject, um, is that I think it's an important educational piece on um, for our customers or patients or whoever it is um, to see if, if you if you still use CBD um, or any other type of product what you're actually failing or, or testing positive on or not testing positive on um, because there are two different types of tests that are that are out there well there's multiple different but two major distinctions of tests that are out there and so um, in in a if, talking about from a, a legal aspect um, what would stand up in a, in a court is the the gas or the um, liquid chromatography test and so that would be the the more important it breaks it down to each one of the compounds so you can actually see if there is THC in the bloodstream um, rather than just a, a cannabinoid. Well hopefully we can get some of these medical questions answered. We weren't sure if he was able to join us uh, but we have uh, Senator Irvin Yen has uh, finished surgery and is able to join us. We uh, want to thank uh, Senator Yen, who is a medical doctor and practices at uh, St. Anthony as an anesthesiologist. And uh, Senator Yen, we did have some questions earlier uh, within the panel regarding um, the restrictions or lack of restrictions on state question 788 as it relates to um, uh, medical conditions. And all of the gentlemen on the panel deferred and said, I'm not a medical doctor. I can't say what should or shouldn't be. So can, can you add to that, well, well, sir? I, is this on now? Yeah. Uh, when I read the state question, it says no qualifying conditions, I believe. Right. So that means it can be utilized for anything. As, a, as, as written. Right. And as a, as a medical doctor, are there particular uh, conditions that you think are, uh, should be qualified for this, as other states have done, or maybe should not be qualified for Yes, this? absolutely. I, I've done a lot of research on this topic in the last two years. I actually had a medical marijuana bill a year ago that uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, but the, the data I've looked at, and I, and I try to look at data that at least there's some evidence that it's useful for certain diagnoses. 
and and of course one is terminal illnesses and those are people that you don't expect to live longer than a year uh, but also uh, neuropathic pain that's pain that's actually caused by nerve damage which could be traumatic it could also be due to say diabetes and then also uh, intractable nausea and vomiting that's unresponsive to other forms of treatment um, chronic wasting disease from cancer or AIDS, uh, so you can stimulate those folks to consume some more calories. So it doesn't treat AIDS, it's not gonna fix AIDS, it's not gonna treat cancer, but it helps stimulate their appetite. And then there is some evidence that's useful for chronic pain that is unresponsive to other forms of treatment. And then uh, the last one, let's see, is muscle spasms from multiple sclerosis or paraplegia. And, and, and those are the conditions that I found that there is at least minimal evidence that it's useful for. Senator, are there any other medical technologies, treatments, therapies, etc., that require the identification of a qualifying, a particular qualifying condition before a doctor can make a recommendation or prescription? Uh, yes, if, if you look at any of the medications that doctors prescribe, there are indications for those drugs, whether it be a, an opioid, a controlled drug, or an antibiotic. There aren't, there aren't laws that require... No, no, there are not laws. Correct, that, absolutely, you're right about that. But there are indications, and those are outlined by the FDA, okay? And they're included in the package insert for all the medications that physicians prescribe, okay? That's that little thin piece of paper that most people throw away that talks about the, you know, the, the side effects the dosages, the pharmacology, uh, and the indications. So those are the diseases that you can prescribe it for. Okay? And then we rely, now, I'm sorry, didn't mean to, didn't mean to Yeah, but, but here's a huge difference, okay? Number one, physicians cannot, according to the DEA, anywhere, actually prescribe medical marijuana, okay? So they can recommend it, okay? And in my opinion, medical marijuana should be treated like, if you're really talking about medical, uh, you know, I'm talking about medical, not recreational. But if we're talking about medical marijuana, it should be treated like, in my opinion, any other drug or medication that we prescribe. And if the benefits outweigh the risks, then okay, you try it. But there's some huge differences with medical marijuana, okay? Number one is, there is no package insert. Number two, uh, our federal government says a Schedule One, so there are no FDA recommendations. Okay, and thirdly, there's no education in medical school on medical marijuana, okay? So you're right, there are, you know, there are no laws that govern these other drugs that we prescribe, okay? But medical marijuana is drastically different for the, the reasons I just said. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I was going to say, maybe that, that's a good uh, opportunity to talk about the difference between some, some federal and state laws and, and what kind of conflicts could arise if state question 788 um, does pass and whether or not how that could affect licensed medical providers like yourself. So, so what is the status of uh, federal law concerning medical marijuana if our attorneys want to weigh in? And if seven que state question 788 passes, so how will Oklahoma's medical marijuana law conflict or how would Oklahoma's medical marijuana laws conflict with federal, federal laws? Well, uh, there is no federal law on medical marijuana. There is a Controlled Substances Act that prohibits the possession, the distribution, or the consumption of marijuana, uh, just as it does other Schedule One drugs. Um, so State Question 788 would not remove federal law enforcement concerns. Uh, there are, of course, um, a few innovations at the federal level, including the Rohrbach or Farr Amendment that prohibit the DOJ from using congressionally allocated funds to enforce the Controlled Substances Act in states where medical marijuana is legal. Uh, and I could, uh, I could continue on that point. We, as, it, as it happens, sitting in the front row is the former federal prosecutor for the Western District of Oklahoma, former United States Attorney Sandy Coates, and it might be remiss not to invite him to speak to the status of federal law on this issue, just as we thought it was Absolutely. important to have a doctor's opinion on the medical questions. Well, thanks, Ms. Uh Thank you, Blake, and, and everyone else. As has been said, uh, it is still illegal under federal law to uh, cultivate, um, sell, or consume marijuana. That's not going to change with 788. Um, 
the status is, is uh, uncertain under federal law in that um, with this administration, uh, Senator, uh, then Senator and now Attorney General Sessions has made it clear throughout his career that uh, he thinks uh, marijuana should be treated as a, uh, as a drug and, and prosecuted uh, like that. Um, that's the position that the uh, uh, Department of Justice has taken. They've been issued a memorandum giving uh, U.S. attorneys around the country uh, the authority to make the decisions as to whether to uh, enforce the Controlled Substances Act uh, uh, with regard to marijuana. Uh, President Trump, however, has sort of sent mis mixed signals about that, about what he thinks uh, uh, should happen with marijuana. Um, and there is some, apparently some movement or some uh, interest in Congress to address this issue. Uh, it is, uh, I think, going to force a, a national conversation, which is what needs to happen. So Congress needs to, to do something. We now uh, have more than half of our states um, where marijuana for medicinal purposes is, is legal, and potentially Oklahoma will be the next one to, to go that way. We also have a number of states, I think it's nine or ten, that have decided in those states that uh, recreational marijuana is legal, uh, which is in direct conflict with, uh, with federal law. So, um, you know, the, the history of it is, is long. I can tell you, when I served in the Obama administration, uh, we made a uh, determination that we would not use um, scarce federal resources to uh, prosecute cases uh, and investigate cases in states where they had a, a legitimate um, scheme to uh, regulate marijuana. And uh, unless it involved children or some um, international cartel or something like that, uh, the policy decision was made to let the states uh, handle it. Um, that's uh, at least on the surface, been turned on its head in this administration. Uh, I have no um, idea whether they'll actually do that or not. Uh, as, the last thing I'll say is for Oklahoma, uh, if medical marijuana passes, um, I think it's very unlikely that the federal government would, uh, or federal investigators would, um, would uh, do investigations that, uh, of entities that are abiding by um, state law. I, I don't think that would be a, a use of uh, federal resources that would be determined. I think that they would probably um, focus, if anywhere, on the states where recreational marijuana is, uh, is legal. Um, but that's hard to say. And it's, it's, uh, it's a cloud, I use that term pejoratively, a cloud <laughs> over the, uh, the industry in that uh, this does uh, um, continue to violate uh, federal law no matter what happens uh, with the border. Thanks for weighing in, Mr. Coates. Yeah, thank you. That's Sandy Coates from Crow and Dunleavy. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> okay, that's probably a, a good segue to talk about uh, recreational, right? Because there's already discussion of a, a ballot measure to get recreational um, on a on a future ballot uh, in Oklahoma. So um, I'm I'm curious, how is that going to affect? Um, the CBD industry. I mean, Jake, is that something CBD uh, Plus would would even consider selling? Would that affect uh, the credibility of the you know the, the sector that you're in at this moment? I, and I'm curious what you folks think about kind of uh, are there clear lines between those who um, you know are in favor of medical marijuana and the recreational? Jake. Um. Speaking from the, the retail side and from CBD Plus, um, I think that right now Oklahoma and um, uh, the people involved here are letting the world know that there is a market for CBD outside of medicinal or recreational marijuana. And so um, we believe that those two products are, while they're, they're very closely related, there is enough of a distinction to where um, there would still be a market and still be a, a very viable um, uh, industry in CBD alone um, outside of anything medicinal or recreational. Now CBD plus and our stance on it is um, obviously we're in the cannabis industry and um, we've we've um, set our whole business up for it and so if it's a way to benefit our customers then uh, we definitely want to carry what we can to help them whether it's with pain or diabetes like Senator Yin was saying um, cancers or, or any of the number of ailments um, especially for terminal patients um, especially for those who are who are in severe um, pain and and who can really benefit from um, from our products and so uh, if we can then we will, but what that looks like, we're not 100% sure. 
And um, we just want to do, again, like I said before, what's in the best interest of our, of our consumers at the end of the day. That's, that's why we're all here. That's why we're all talking about it is because I think that everybody here really does tremendously care about the general public and we want what's best for, for them in the end result. And so, um, you know, we're in favor of, of regulation and um, we're not here to, to dictate or tell what, what kind of regulations are, are needed. Um, we can have our input, but at the end of the day, um, we just want to serve our customers and, and give them an outlet, um, a way to get the product and a way to get relief. Um, so I'm, we're a business publication, of course, and, and we're interested in, in the development of this as a business. If it passes, there are legitimate businesses in other states. So if those uh, people are interested in getting involved within the medical marijuana industry, are there, what are these most immediate and pressing concerns that they should be aware of or that they need to be mindful of? Um, from my perspective, there are, there are quite a few. Uh, so, you know, uh, 10 years ago in Oklahoma, or for most of the United States for that matter, if you were involved in the cultivation, distribution, or even consumption of marijuana, uh, you had need for basically one kind of lawyer, uh, and that's a criminal defense attorney. Uh, today, uh, or I should say, if 788 is enacted, uh, the legal needs that face those who are already in the industry uh, as as is Jake, or uh, those who are interested in jumping into the industry will be um, varied and diverse. Uh, so you are going to immediately need to take uh, serious stock of your options in terms of corporate formation, uh, in terms of tax planning. The Internal Revenue Code is written in a way that is uh, um, extraordinarily punitive yes. toward uh, this industry. Um, it prohibits business deductions from any entity that is involved in the trafficking of a controlled substance. And let me be clear, it does not prohibit uh, business deductions for folks who are involved in illegal industries. Uh, it prohibits business deductions for folks that are involved in drug trafficking. So if I was a paid assassin uh, and I flew to California to carry out a hit, I could deduct the cost of my bullets, the cost right. of my airfare, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not so for the um, marijuana industry, even the med medical marijuana industry. Uh, no such business deductions can be made. So it is extraordinarily important that from the outset of uh, folks' prospective uh, engagement in this industry, they get sound and credible legal counsel uh, on, on these and a variety of other issues. Uh, I think intellectual property is going to be probably the most important legal intervention that industry participants in a state like Oklahoma can make. Uh, I think most people on this panel, I, I assume, would agree with me that liberalization of marijuana laws at the federal level is eventually inevitable. And when that happens in a small market like Oklahoma, the most valuable assets that industry participants will own will be their intellectual property portfolio. So I encourage any client who speaks to me about prospective involvement in this industry to put serious consideration into their branding strategy and to consult with lawyers to ensure that that branding strategy is protected. Uh, we also, of course, want to advise clients about uh, regulatory compliance and to emphasize to them that 788, as has been discussed here, is not by any means the uh, end of the, reg the scope of regulations that concern this industry, both because additional regulations will be promulgated, but also because extant regulations will govern things like pesticide use for cultivators, uh, the selection of fertilizers, waste disposal, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the answer, I think, to, the, to your question, what kind of legal needs uh, are uh, face industry participants in the cannabis space is that there are many. They are widely varied and diverse, and you are setting yourself up to lose your shirt if you jump into this industry without effective consultation from a competent and responsible attorney who is remains vigilant about keeping up with a very, very fastly uh, and, 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 um, and unpredictably evolving legal landscape uh, that surrounds this industry. Absolutely. I'd add to that that there's very clear land use provisions, protocols that will be required to be implemented both at the state and local levels. Um, there, we have a lot of issues with financing mechanisms. Uh, if you look in other jurisdictions that 
have been effective in implementing a medical program. Uh, there's a strong need to prohibit uh, the, the presence of organized crime and illicit financing of these operations. So as a result, we've seen the enactment of protocols for financial disclosures and intensive background checks recommendations. Uh, and we will be recommending those here in Oklahoma as well. So we definitely encourage folks to really know what they're doing before they decide to uh, get invested in this industry. Um, the 50 members of our organization, uh, these range from $500 million operations that are currently in Oklahoma and other enterprises to uh, small operators that own restaurants. Uh, you have people that are engaging with counsel, that are engaging with branding experts, that are visiting enterprises in other legal jurisdictions to really have a firm understanding, business plan, model, and responsible portfolio of how they're going to address this issue here in <laughs> Oklahoma. Now, unfortunately, there's still so many variables that are unknown because we do not have comprehensive regulations in place to address all of these matters, and we're hoping that our uh, esteemed legislators will come back and implement these comprehensive regulations once 788 passes. Thanks, bud. We've got about 10 minutes left, a little bit less than 10 minutes, so I think we've got time for, for one question, and then we'll do some closing thoughts. Um, so I, I'd like to be able to address something that um, August brought up um, a moment ago, Senator Yen, before you came in. He mentioned uh, medical marijuana and mental health issues, and, and we were talking about um, you know, whether or not um, mental health issues um, or someone with mental health issues mental health issues um, should receive a recommendation for medical marijuana. Is that something you could weigh in on or, or kind of elaborate on? Well, I have not seen any uh, good evidence that medical marijuana is useful, say, for post-traumatic stress disorder so far. Now, maybe in the future we will, or anxiety or depression. And in fact, there are some studies that show that it could make depression worse. And I went to a lecture, which some people in this room might have gone to about two months ago, uh, by a psychiatrist from Texas uh, who's in addiction medicine and has a treatment center down there in Dallas. And he, he gave some very, very interesting data about uh, marijuana. And one of the things he said is that chronic long-term use of marijuana, uh, and that, albeit this is heavy use, uh, decreases people's IQ by eight points. Okay. Uh, so so that's, that's certainly significant. And we do know from studies that <coughs> marijuana can be addictive in, in some adults. It's pretty rare, but it can be. Uh, but more so in teenagers. It's about 5% uh, higher uh, rate of addiction in teenagers. And we also know that the younger teenagers start using marijuana, the greater chance that they will as adults be problem smokers. What does that mean? That means smoking marijuana interferes with their normal life. And, and so absolutely mental health, you know, that's, that's huge. And uh, we've got to look at that. And, and, I, and I will say, as a physician, how can I be against medical marijuana? But as I've said before, it needs to be real medical marijuana. It needs to be treated like any other drug. It's got benefits, it's got risks. If the benefits outweigh the risks, you use it. Now, I will tell you that about six months ago, uh, someone from the DEA told me that there were a couple of cannabidiol products that the FDA was looking at, and he, th this DEA person thought that if the FDA approved these, either one of these or both of them, that the feds would have no choice but to reschedule marijuana as not Schedule One. And about a month ago, I read an article that an FDA panel unanimously did approve a product called Epidiolex, which is a CBD product. Now, I'm sure it's got to go through some more hurdles before it gets absolutely approved, but this, it was unanimously approved by an FDA panel. And so things are going to be drastically changing, I think, in the next several years. And, and again, mental health is, is something that's very, very important, very important. As you, know, you could say if you were talking about legalizing alcohol right now, let's say it's illegal, we were talking about legalizing it. Yeah, you worry about mental health issues. You worry about people who get addicted to uh, alcohol, basically. And I, I think to support what Senator Yen is uh, bringing up here, uh, nobody is calling for children to have access, unfettered access to medical cannabis products. Uh, I think that's something we're all committed to, making sure that there's enough protections in place and rigorous standards um, that any children that receive treatment with these products, that it be under the care of a physician uh, and their guardians, um, and that 
like we said earlier, this is a very, use of medicine in general can be very subjective because you have different reactions from different people, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, different impacts for different patients. So this is definitely something where folks with mental health issues, um, it may not be the right product for them. And that's something that we highly encourage that their physicians uh, determine with those patients individually. Thank you. Maybe if you'd each like to have some closing thoughts, uh, we can start with you, Blake. Well, um, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a policymaker, and uh, I'm not here to argue um, either in favor or against any particular policy, but instead to offer uh, candid legal analysis about um, any, any proposal. Uh, I, that said, I see a lot of commentary about 788, um, and in particular the legal ramifications of 788 that um, I think is, uh, is misleading. Uh, and I would encourage anyone who is interested in 788, whether you intend to vote yes or no, uh, to read the state question, because I think by its own language, it uh, dispels a lot of the, uh, the rumors uh, about what medical marijuana would look like in Oklahoma. And if you're interested in going a step further, I would encourage you to take stock of the fact that there are 30 states uh, an increasing majority of the United States of America has already adopted liberalization of marijuana laws, specifically with respect to medical marijuana. Um, and the sky is not falling. Um, the, uh, their economies aren't crashing. They, their rehabs are not um, filling with uh, hordes of new addicts. Uh, so I think there is ample data out there, both in terms of the law itself and in terms of how similar laws have affected other states and jurisdictions to make an educated decision about how you want to vote on 788. Uh, I, let me echo what Blake said. Please read the, the state question. Uh, I've gone to a lot of uh, discussions where most people haven't read it, and so I do encourage everyone to read it. Um, obviously, I'm here on a, on, on a different side, on the opposing side. Uh, our mission is to prevent abuse and make sure that people realize that whatever, however this goes, should it pass, there's going to be a price to pay, negatively or positively, whatever. Obviously, I'm here to speak up for the people who are going to be negatively affected by this. I think they also need a voice in this. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Alex. Uh, as a representative of the Industry Association here in Oklahoma, I really want to uh, thank all the panelists here for their varying views on this issue and for your expert analysis. This is a very serious critical issue for thousands of Oklahomans. These are people that are dealing with pain. These are people dealing with crippling medical, condi medical conditions that we believe ultimately should have access, easy access, to a product that has had very limited demonstrated negative side effects uh, as opposed to what we've seen in other communities. I want to throw one statistic out there. Here in Oklahoma, as an attorney, I've done a lot of work with children, uh, guardian ad litem work. I've seen the ravages of methamphetamine and opioid addiction in this community. In states that have legalized medical marijuana, we're seeing an average reduction of 25% in opioid use, abuse, and overdoses. That right there should be enough for us to encourage our friends and neighbors to vote yes on 788. We have to remember that this is a framework, it's a skeletal framework that establishes and creates the right to use through a medical uh, recommendation to uh, cultivate, to process, distribute through a well-regulated network. And that's something we're committed to doing. Uh, I think that we're gonna see uh, a groundswell of support here in Oklahoma for this issue uh, from some single issue voters that usually don't come out um, and vote on other issues or for candidates. Um, once that happens, I think that it's incumbent upon our policymakers to um, come together, perhaps in a special session, and push for a well-regulated system that's responsible, that will help get these products to these people in need in as uh, quick as a process as possible while protecting our public safety. So thank you guys for your time.
That's very well said. Um, thank you to everybody who supported the industry in one way or another. If you're for it or against it and you're being an advocate either way, you're still supporting the industry and doing what's right. And so I just first of all want to thank everybody who's involved watching at home, um, sitting in here. Everybody, thank you for coming in here and supporting the, this uh, this panel and this discussion. Um, I would just like to say that, that we are honored to be in your communities and to um, serve you with the highest quality and the, the, the best possible products. Um, and that's what we'll continue to do no matter what the industry does. And so if you're looking for a source of education or a source that you can, that you can trust somebody to talk to, even if you um, don't know anything, that's what our staff is, is there for. And there's, there's, there's other groups out there too, um, but I don't know what they, what they train and what they say, but I definitely know that our staff is, is well trained for you guys to go in there and use them as a resource, whether you're for the industry or against it. Thank you, Jake. Senator Yen. Yeah, first, first of all, I just want to say that, uh, you know, other states have legalized marijuana in some manner, whether it's recreational or uh, medical or, or both. And we can look at those states for data. And you have to look at the data very, very closely, okay? Very closely. I have not seen any evidence that opioid deaths or opioid abuse in states that have legalized it have gone down. I've not seen that, okay? Perhaps that we will, but so far I've not seen that. In Colorado, law enforcement would tell you that crime has gone up, okay? Crime has definitely gone up according to law enforcement in Colorado. But you got to look at that data very closely. Is it going up because people are smoking marijuana or using marijuana? Or has crime gone up because now all of a sudden in Denver you have, I was told, more dispensaries than McDonald's, Taco Bell's, and Wendy's combined. Okay, so all of a sudden you've got these new successful businesses that take cash, right? So are the criminals burglarizing and robbing these places and that's why your crime has gone up? That could be. Law enforcement in Colorado will also tell you that deaths, car accidents, deaths, involving a driver that has marijuana in their system, the, the fatalities have doubled. But they will also tell you, but you know, that could be because previously we didn't test everybody for marijuana who was involved in a, in a car accident where there was a fatality. So you've got to look at the data very, very closely. And, and it really ticks me off people that gives you, that give you part of the data, just trying to influence you one way or the other, okay? I, I consider myself a scientist and I look at the data very, very closely. Now, 788 is going to be on the ballot June 26th. We're all going to vote on it. Voters are going to vote on it and decide whether they want it or not. And is 788 really medical marijuana? Well, the voters need to decide if they <coughs> think it is. If 788 should pass June 26th, I think the legislature has no choice but to come up with laws to regulate it because obviously 788 is not complete. If 788 fails, I promise you that as a physician in the legislature, I will continue to work on medical marijuana in this state. I promise you I'll do that. I'm the one who had the bill that legalized CBD three years ago. I will do that. And I, and I had somebody on another panel about two months ago say, why hadn't the legislature done anything about marijuana until now, until the 788 popped up? Well, guess what? We have been working on it. So I hope everybody out there who's watching uh, or listening reads 788 very, very closely. And if they don't understand it, ask somebody that understands it to explain it to them. And I hope these people show up June 26th and vote on the bill. Thank you, Senator Yen. Let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs> and another big thank you to our sponsors, Crow and Dunleavy, CBD Plus, and New Health Solutions Oklahoma Incorporated. And if you are interested in reading uh, the bill, the ballot measure, it is available on the Secretary of State's website. You can do a simple Google search for SQ788 and read the bill. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you for tuning in.